everybody. Uh, I'm Terry Kylo from Paths to Understanding. And I'm John Hale from Northwest Interface. We are so excited to have you join us today for Hear Me, Stand With Me. As you log on, we would ask that you use the chat feature to announce your first name and what you hope uh, for in this webinar today. LGBTQ plus prejudices harm people of many groups and divide us from one another. Often we don't fully appreciate the challenges that various groups are facing and so fail to work together for our common good. Hear Me, Stand With Me is an opportunity to hear the struggles of many groups through story, poetry, music, and art, and learn what it means to stand with that group to create a better life for all of us. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that all of us are currently standing on the traditional land of Coast Salish peoples, and we honor with gratitude the land itself and the Coast Salish peoples. We are all in this together, and our futures are inseparably bound up with one another. So today, we don't just want to hear these stories. We want to get directly connected with each other and actively stand with each other to create a better world. We will continue this series with LGBTQ plus communities. We look forward to listening to Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Ahmadiyya, Sikh, Latinx, and Asian American communities as we co-create future sessions in, in, in the coming months. And we're grateful for our co-sponsors for this event, Northwest Interfaith, Paths to Understanding, the Interfaith Community Sanctuary, Call of Compassion Northwest, St. Patrick Roman Catholic Church. We'd like to invite your financial support to help cover the expenses of these events. And so we're posting a link in the comments section uh, for a contribution link, which you'll also get in an email later. There are two parts to this meeting. First, there will be a series of presentations hearing some of the lived experiences of people harmed by LGBTQIA plus prejudice in the context of faith traditions, especially the Abrahamic ones, learning what we can all do to stand together. And then we'll engage in a spiritual practice. We'll have a five minute break, and then we'll move into the second portion of our event today, which is a conversation. So there'll be two breakout sessions there. One will be a, one with about four people, to share some of what you've heard and what's kind of occurred to you during this uh, during the time, and then a breakout session to help you get connected to leaders of each group. Again, we are so excited you're here. We encourage you to stand and stretch during this session and take bio breaks as you need. We will be doing the same. We will have three groups today sharing their perspectives on LGBTQ plus issues in their respective Abrahamic traditions. They will present in the order of the emergence of their tradition. So we begin with the Jewish tradition. Hello, I'm Rabbi Anson Leitner from Northwest Interfaith, and I'm going to introduce the two Jewish speakers. Shelley Cohen is a longtime member and past president of Temple Beth Am in Seattle. She is also a member of the Commission on Social Action of Reform Judaism a policy development and leadership body of the Reform Jewish movement in North America. She has been involved in numerous social justice efforts over the years, especially involving LGBTQA plus rights. Her happy place is at the intersection of Judaism and queerness, where she can express both identities without friction or fear. Roy Hamrick is a longtime Seattle resident. He has been act, an active member of both local Jewish and LGBTQ plus communities over the past 30 years. He has served as a member of and in a variety of volunteer positions for numerous nonprofit and religious organizations in the Seattle area, including Temple to Hirsch Sinai, the Pride Foundation, Multi-Faith Works, the Greater Seattle Business Association, Temple Beth Am, and the Jewish Federation of Greater Seattle. He is a longtime board member, board officer of Congregation Tikva Hadasha, Seattle's LGBTQ plus Jewish Chabura. Shelly and Roy, thank you so much for being here with us. How can we hear you and stand with you? Go ahead and begin. Um, so I'm Shelly, I use she, her pronouns. Um, 
I want to thank everybody who's put this program together. It's so amazing to be in this company and um, also thanking Rabbi Leitner for inviting me for this opportunity. Um, so here's my story. I grew up in a conservative synagogue in Los Angeles in a part of town that had a pretty big Jewish presence, not as big as New York City, but still you didn't have to work hard at being Jewish like you might if you were growing up in, I don't know, Omaha. Um, there was plenty of Passover food in the grocery store in the springtime and Hanukkah candles in December. They didn't put all the Jewish stuff out at the same time the way they do here in Seattle. Um, the public schools didn't close for the high holy days, but the movie theaters did because in the days before megaplexes, the synagogues rented out those big auditoriums for overflow services. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the different streams of Judaism, the conservative movement is somewhere in the middle, not as rigid as the Orthodox about some things, but also not as flexible on some things as the reform movement. And what I just said is a massive oversimplification. Um, Jews and Judaism are way more complex than we have time to get into here. So I'm gonna be talking about this from my personal perspective. Um, when I became bat mitzvah in 1971, that right was just beginning to be commonplace for girls. And I didn't really know what my path was supposed to be from there. The role models for women in Judaism were pretty limited. There were no women rabbis, no women cantors. There was the synagogue sisterhood and maybe a few other committees you could join, but not the important ones. You could be a rabbitson, a rabbi's wife, um, but that was entirely heteronormative because all the rabbis were male. Um, and then in the mid seventies, I came out. As far as I knew, not only were there no queer rabbis, there just weren't any other queer Jews which left me with a real dilemma, which half of my identity would I give up? I gave up Judaism. I wandered in the wilderness for several years, less than 40, but long enough that when I didn't go to services on the high holy days and didn't fast on Yom Kippur, I had stopped feeling guilty about it. And at that point, I realized that I missed being Jewish. I heard about a small group of queer Jews who met on Friday nights in a church on Capitol Hill. That's where I first met Roy, in fact. Then I heard about a reform congregation on Mercer Island that had a gay cantor, an out gay cantor. That became my spiritual home for many years until the congregation moved to Bellevue, which was just too far to drive every week. So I joined a different reform congregation in Seattle where I've been a very active member for more than 25 years. Both of those congregations welcomed me and were there for me when I needed them. But welcoming today looks kind of different from what it did 25 years ago. Even the language is different. Where we once talked about welcoming, today we talk about being embracing. The difference is this. Welcoming is when someone invites you into their home. Embracing is when you feel like you are home. So what does that look like? There are some obvious things, and I imagine these cut across all our faith traditions. Things like having a statement on your website that specifically says, we welcome LGBTQ plus people. That specificity is really important um, because the major religions in this country have historically been hostile to queer folk. When a house of worship says they welcome everyone, we queer folk hear everyone but you. That's from a study I read some years back, and unfortunately I haven't been able to find it again, um, so I can't give you this citation. Um, there's things like all gender restrooms, which are really important when we're able to gather in person again, or changing the language on your registration forms for religious school to say parent one and parent two instead of mother and father. Ask people to add their pronouns to their name tags, but you need to make sure you've done the work first to understand why they're doing it so it doesn't backfire. So far, this is like building a wheelchair ramp to your door and making sure the door is wide enough for a person using a wheelchair to enter. But what's really key is what happens when they get inside. Is there literally a seat at the table for them? That plays out in a lot of ways for queer folk. To be embraced in a congregation means being able to see ourselves there. 
We want to see ourselves in the traditions that have existed for so long. To see families with two moms or two dads called up to light the Shabbat candles at Friday night services. To see a same-sex couple get the traditional wedding blessing before their marriage. And we also want to see new traditions created that reflect our reality. A blessing for someone who's about to have gender-affirming surgery, for example. A teacher of mine, Rabbi B'nai Lappi, talks about donkey stories. If donkeys could read the Torah, she says, they'd notice all the donkey stories that humans don't pay attention to. Mm -hmm. Look, says the donkey, there I am. Not only are there donkey stories in Torah, there are queer stories as well. Take the story of Isaac and Rebecca. When Rebecca sees Isaac for the first time as she approaches his dwelling, she's so struck by his beauty that she falls off her, well, it's a camel actually, not a donkey, but you get the idea. <laughs> Earlier in the passage, when we first encounter Rebecca, the Hebrew word that's usually translated as maiden is actually written in the masculine form. Now you could write that off to a scribal error in the original manuscript, but why? Instead, when we talk about this text, let's lean into that gender bending and let the pretty boys and the masculine girls see themselves in the story. When you read the story of Jacob, the mild, smooth-skinned twin disguising himself as Harry Esau in order to get his father's blessing, and someone suggests that Jacob is cross-dressing, they're not wrong. They're seeing their own experience in the text. We need to validate that and then see what all of us can learn from it. There are also passages in our sacred texts that have done some serious harm. I'm thinking, of course, of the so-called clobber passages in Leviticus that have been used for centuries to rationalize hate and violence against queer people. As tempting as it is to skip over them and pretend they're not there, we need to confront the damage they've done. We may not be ever able to fully redeem those passages, although there are many alternative interpretations out there that come close, but by confronting them, we can start to heal. The genderedness of the Hebrew language adds another layer to queer inclusion. When someone has the honor of being called to Torah, they're called by their Hebrew name, so-and-so, son or daughter of. The name for our rite of passage to young adulthood, the bar or bat mitzvah, is likewise gendered. How do we embrace non-binary people who do not see themselves as a son or a daughter? Synagogues are experimenting with ways to adjust the language, referring to a B mitzvah rather than bar or bat, for example, so that people of all gender identities can feel fully included. There's a concept in Judaism called nefesh ger, the soul of the stranger. Because we were strangers in the land of Egypt, we can empathize with the stranger and come to understand their experience. This is where true inclusion comes from, not asking the stranger to change himself to fit our ways, but by opening and expanding our tents to make room for everyone's experiences. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, Shelley, that was that was great. Do I head on in now with my portion here? Yes, please. We'd love to hear from you, Roy. Okay. Uh, again, I'm Roy Hamrick, and uh, I very much like Shelley, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be on the in, participate in this program today. Thank you to Anson, and Rabbi Anson, for inviting me and to Paths to Understanding for the work that you do and to the board members, John Hale uh, and other my fellow presenters. Um, very much looking forward to your messages and as well as all the uh, people who've chosen to participate in the program. Um, I identify as a gay man and as a Jewish man. Uh, and my comments though, I'm not a, certainly a spokesperson for either the LGBTQ plus community or, uh, or for Judaism, but I will speak from my own experience as an active community member in both uh, and in the Seattle community as well. With regard to my personal journey, uh, in some ways, I'm kind of a one person any interfaith uh, example. My story is a little bit different from Shelley's. I uh, grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area 
And my mother and her family were Jewish, although totally assimilated. And my father and his family were uh, members of the Congregational Church. Uh, my parents divorced when I was very young, when I was a year and a half old. And uh, my mother had custody, but my father would come and pick me and my sister up every Sunday morning and take us. He would take us to Sunday school at the Congregational Church. And actually, I enjoyed it very much. The thundering of onward Christian soldiers on the piano in the basement, I enjoyed it a lot. But the re religion didn't resonate for me. And as I was growing up, a teenager, I really thought of myself as atheist. Um, but as I grew older and got into my 20s, uh, something wasn't right. I, did, I felt like I was, I was sick in some way. I knew I wasn't physically sick and I didn't feel like I was mentally sick, but uh, it didn't feel right. And I knew that if I did not do something, I would get, get sick. And so I actually, I left the Bay Area and I came up here to Seattle and uh, that was in 1978 and started looking around, including um, in checking out some of the spiritual options here. And uh, what I discovered, what I figured out here was that I was, um, I was spiritually starving. Um, that's how I looked at it. I very much did believe in God. And uh, one Friday night, I sort of I stumbled into the Temple of the Hirsch and I thought, well, I'll check this out. I knew my mother's family was Jewish. I had no exp exposure to it as a child, though. And it was just right. It fit. It was like putting on an old sweater or another metaphor that I use for this is... Uh, it was like I was the hardware and I had and I was missing the operated in software. And with, as uh, Shelley uh, mentioned to the Rabbi Star there, you were slaves in the land of Egypt. And that fully resonated with me, along with the other uh, important values of how we treat each other as human beings. We are not all perfect, but we try to be our best selves. Uh, it just it just made such uh, sense and it felt just so right for me. Part of the of the aspect of Judaism, I believe, is that it's not about answers. It's not about doctrine. As Shelley pointed out, there is a whole raft of uh, approaches within the Jewish community: Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, Reconstructionist. So there's no you can't say there's one thing that's uh, that's Judaism or uh, hierarchical uh, order. We are all responsible for uh, for understanding and knowing our getting to know our religion. Um, as I said, questions were coming up on the time of Passover, our annual retelling of the story of the, ex the Exodus from Egypt, and at that time children are encouraged are asked to are encouraged to ask questions and as we have bar bat mitzvah children are uh, they becoming an adult and they are study the torah and then are asked to comment to prepare their own devar as shelley just gave us earlier interpretation of the torah over the millennia rabbis have argued about what it says in the bible and uh, they don't come to any conclusions. They sort of argue for a while and then they go on to the next subject. So that's very Jewish, this approach of asking questions and that felt very natural to me. So I found this religion that was very meaningful to me, but I didn't at that time, this is in the early 1980s, I didn't feel particularly welcomed. It was tolerated. I could be coming to services, but it didn't feel like I was welcomed in the traditional uh, Jewish synagogue. And uh, then a few years later, a friend informed me about the congregation Tikva Hadasha, where Shelley uh, at one point was connected. And uh, that was the LGBT Jewish community, we call it uh, CTC for short. And there I found not only uh, the Judaism that I love, but also a warming, welcoming group of people. And so I became, that's been my home ever since to be part of the CTC family. It's a story of success, I think, here in Seattle that with regard to LGBT uh, issues in the Jewish community, people uh, initially, there was hostility, there wasn't good acceptance, but through work 
uh, that people like Shelley have done uh, over the years. She mentioned uh, when cantor David Sirkin Poole came out at the uh, B'nai Torah. Initially, the congregation, I think of a lot of the congregation even left uh, B'nai Torah, but Rabbi Morel stood beside him. And uh, ultimately, what has happened here, I believe, in our Jewish community in Seattle is that there has been a turnaround, that there's been acceptance of, uh, of LGBT. And now, while we still maintain a separate uh, group, Congregation Tikva Harasha, our uh, people are, have been connected, are actually now members, mostly like Shelley's at Beth Am. I'm a member at Beth Am. And on, not only uh, members of the various uh, synagogues, but on the board and in leadership positions. So and I, what I see here in Seattle, there's been a, a real aggressive uh, approach to, uh, to welcoming, to, to making change, to welcome. And part of that, one of the things that I did uh, initially with our group, we would go and we would visit, uh, take people from this gay synagogue and we would visit other synagogues, uh, let them know we were coming and, and worship with them to show that not only were we, there were a lot of gay, lesbian, Jews around to be visible, but also our passion for the religion and that it was not an act of rebellion that we were trying to, we wanted to be part of the community. I have seen here in, in our community where uh, Pride Shabbat, I think that was started by Cantor Sirkin Poole around 1981, where 19, uh, 2001, where uh, people from the LGBT community came for the week for the Shabbat service at during the Pride, during Gay Pride in the summer, and ultimately then the Jewish Federation got on board with helping ha conduct those uh, gatherings. And in fact, what is happening now is that all the synagogues, the conservative and reform reconstructionist synagogues, they compete over which synagogue gets to hold the LGBT uh, Pride Shabbat event each year. Um, also, I would say that what I've seen is when the issue of gay marriage came up, uh, Jewish community was very active in supporting of that. And I think the Washington state was one of the first to approve same-sex marriage in the country. And I, I believe that it's firmly that the Jewish community, the Jewish Federation, the Jewish community were prime movers in making that, making that happen. So I feel very welcomed at this point. Uh, um, there's yet work to be done. Shelley had very good comments about the things that we need to be watching as, as all different kinds of faiths, things we can be doing to, to make sure that LGBT people are do feel welcome. Uh, but I know that when I go to Temple Beth Am, like Shelley was saying, there's a rainbow flag next to the front door. And that does help me to feel like I am very welcome when I see same-sex couples up on the pulpit doing candle lighting. That makes me know that this is not just tokenism, but it's more a true welcoming kind of activity. So when we're working in the areas of transgender or certainly in other communities um, around the country, around the world. Um, and I, what my hope is actually, it's a very strong gay lesbian community here uh, in, in the Seattle area, as well as we have strong uh, communities of faith. And can we take the social capital that we have and the strengths and, and turn that around and direct it, what we have achieved here, towards other pressing problems here? In other words, I think of homelessness or wealth inequality. These are really we have people sleeping on the streets around our city. And can we take our strengths um, with our communal uh, cohesion, our social capital, can we work using the kind of models we've done to achieve this, the, the acceptance we have here, can we use those communal strengths to address some of the problems that are really critical in our community this day. So I thank you again so much for your for being here to, as Shelley is saying, there's a vast, massive amounts of things we could say about Judaism, about what it says in the Torah, interpretations and so forth. We'll maybe get in a little bit further in the breakout sessions, um, but I wanted to give you that my perspective that I am really uh, proud really of what we have been able to achieve here in the Seattle area with regard to the Judaism and acceptance of, of the um, 
LGBT community. Thank you. Roy, thank you so much. Uh, and Shelly, thank you as well. And we're just appreciative that you're here with us today. And um, I just want to have us all just take a moment uh, and, and just in silence, just reflect on what we've heard as we appreciate Roy and Shelley's leadership. Thank you all for taking that moment of time. And um, our next group is led by, by three folk, three Christians, uh, Pastor Laura harris Faree, Pastor Gary Southerton, and Pastor Jermel Witherspoon. Pastor Laura harris Faree is originally from Ohio and grateful to be living in the great state of Washington. Pastor Laura serves as the pastor of outreach and community at Luther Memorial Lutheran Church in the Broadmoor neighborhood of Seattle. This congregation is a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Pastor Laura has been ordained for one year and is excited to see where ministry might lead. If Pastor Laura isn't at the church, you might find them spending time with their spouse, Kate, or Black Cat Jurgen. Pastor Gary Southerton will also join us. He's currently the pastor of Broadview Community United Church of Christ in North Seattle and has been serving in this capacity for the last five years. Gary is a native of Seattle and grew up in Finney Ridge, Greenwood neighborhood. He was ordained a Catholic priest in Seattle in 1988 by Archbishop Raymond Hunthausen. He has transferred his ordination to the United Church of Christ in 2011. He has over 30 years of experience in pastoral care and nonprofit management in the secular arena, as well as in the church as a pastor. He holds degrees from the University of Washington, Columbia University, and the Catholic University of America. Pastor Jermel Witherspoon is a native Seattleite. Jermel pastors Liberation United Church of Christ, Everett United Church of Christ, and works for a nonprofit called Zeno Math. Pastor Jamel is passionate about bringing the unwavering, unfailing, inclusive love of God to the world, starting with his community. Jamel has been active in ministry for over 10 years, and at 31 years of age, is passionate and eager to draw others to a safe and loving community within a radically gracious creator. He is a graduate of Seattle University, from which he earned a master's degree in theology in pastoral studies. Gary, Laura, and Jermel, we're so thankful that you're here with us today. How can we hear you and stand with you? I believe that we discussed I was going first. <laughs> I knew you all were thinking. I hope he remembers. Um, hello. Hello. Um, first, I just want to honor those who came before me. Um, I want to honor um, my Jewish siblings. Um, Judaism indeed is something that has deeply influenced um, and birthed um, this movement of Christianity. Um, and so we have a lot of things in common and we have a lot of things um, that are different because we were trying to path apparently a different way. Um, and contrary to Roy's expression, um, Christianity, um, especially the Christianity that I come from is deeply rooted um, in answers <laughs> and deeply rooted in doctrine um, and deeply rooted in the things um, that are contrary to Judaism that say we have to agree on this. And in fact, we have gotten together saying that there are things that we need to agree on in order to actually be a part of this movement hilarious. 
Um, and I think that the end result of that was that we agree that we actually don't have much um, and that we don't have to um, because that is the beauty of an amazing um, God who indeed empowers all of us through God's power to believe and to grow um, into whatever we will need to believe and to grow into in order to move through this universe and this world. Um, and so I grew up actually um, in a subset of Christianity that was very evangelical um, and that was very othering um, and that was very clear. Um, oh, let me take that back. I won't say very clear. Um, they were very clear about their stance on the LGBTQI community as it pertained to open um, acceptance and affirmation. I am with you, um, Shelly, when you talk about, I say affirmation um, and acceptance, um, the affirming space wherein not only are you welcome to be here if you act right <laughs> um, and if you don't tell anybody um, and if you don't, you know, we don't ask, you don't tell, right? Um, which indeed for my community and some of the communities that came out, I've come out of, the spirit of lying, <laughs> um, I can't put it any, any more clearer than that, um, has been detrimental um, and has caused um, so much pain and hurt and death and fear um, based upon horrible interpretation um, of what we see as our wisdom book, book of wisdom, um, not only horrible um, interpretation, but right interpretation of horrible ideas. <laughs> Those are things too. Um, and so we decide what we want to keep um, and what we would think is acceptable um, lines of communication and, um, and beauty of thought. Um, and we decide what we need to throw out, um, which has I would think, right, would be acceptable in the ways in which we live our life because we do it every single day of our life. Um, we figure out what we need. We figure out what we don't need. We figure out what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, what is fruitful, what does not bear fruit. Um, and then we live our life based upon what we need in those spaces. And so I learned um, to live my life based upon what I need in those spaces. But I come out of a tradition that has been taught to live their life um, in spaces of secrecy and in spaces of shame um, based upon someone else's understanding of what should be. And I will say in this moment, I want to kind of rest and that for my siblings who have not been able to um, come into a space of safety. For Christians and, 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 and Muslims and Jews and all those who make up um, some of these spaces wherein we've had our ideas about what is acceptable and what is not. So I just wanna honor that as well. And, um, since it is deeply my story um, and I get to name it, and I also hope that you all will name um, when I have one minute left, um, because I will not be the one that goes over because folks in my tradition um, where I come from are usually the ones who go over. Um, so please spare me the shame. Um, I come from a space where in deeply, 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 it is, um, it is acceptable to work in the space and give of your talent and your gift and the spirit that is in you. Um, and, and we will take that, right? In the earlier tradition that I became a part of, I am now United Church of Christ. I pastor two churches, every United Church of Christ, Liberation United Church of Christ, woo woo, um, wherein we are cultivating new thought um, and new mindsets around that. And people are helping me come into those new mindsets and new thoughts. Um, there are actually people on the line right now. Um, I don't wanna start naming people, but um, pastors in the UCC, retired pastors in the UCC. I think I see Mimi and I see Peggy and I see Ruth. Um, these are people who have actually helped me to come over and are helping me to come over into this space of UCCism um, and um, helping me to kind of vet out some of the old thinking 
thinking because it's really easy to convert back to old thinking, especially when stuff gets hard. Um, and so I want to name that, but I also want to name that I thank the higher power, I thank the divine for bringing me to a space where I understand um, that the beautifulness, the beauty of the divine, it lies in the multiplicity of thought. Um, and in the ways that we can bring forth God um, called by many names in many things of many things of many thoughts. Um, and I just honor that. Um, so I honor you all being on here in this space and I honor God for bringing me to that space in my life and showing me even the more um, because I've not always been in that space. I was one who gave and gave and gave and gave um, and was denied, um, denied me. <laughs> um, until I realized, how in the hell do you take me away? How, how do you deny me, me? Um, uh-uh, something's got to change. This, is, this can't work. Um, not working for me. Um, and so I was ushered into a space by the spirit that I will never forget and I will always honor the spirit for. Um, at a time where I didn't think there was anything left. I dealt with lineage. Not only did I deal with being in a space wherein um, I had been taught that my wholeness, my being was a sin. Um, I was in a space wherein there was lineage attached to that, where I was fifth and sixth generation, mm -hmm. this particular subset of people that believed in this God this way. Um, and then the spirit said, now break off and now go in the way in which I have led you because you will only find true freedom and the freedom that I bring um, and I found it and I'm finding it um, and sometimes I lose it and then I find it again but being in a space wherein I have the privilege to drop it and say oh shoot let me pick it up again um, and run with it um, is indeed an honor um, where am I at in time you're you're getting pretty close brother getting pretty I, I, I appreciate you Terry hold me accountable for that um, so yeah <laughs> So that's that's that. Um, and my story is deep um, and it is wide and it is shallow and it is here and it is there and it is now and it is me and it is us and it, it is those who are to come. And so thank you. Um, and what you can do, I believe, was a part of the question to honor um, what we are speaking about, what I'm speaking about um, is just know that it is my story. Um, and that it cannot be um, taken away or added to unless I give permission. Um, and do know that um, it is our story and we are still trying to map out um, and create what that story looks like. And you all give us um, 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 such help in, in that as well. Um, and so thank you. Thank you, and I'm going to try and go quick too, so I am not the one uh, to going over time. <laughs> My story begins at the age of 17 in 2011, when I texted a high school friend and asked, how do you know if you are gay? Now that should have been a sign, right? That I was texting that question at all, but being LGBTQIA plus in small town Ohio takes some convincing. After letting a few friends know my parents started to catch on that a girl I was, had been spending a lot of time with might not just have been a friend. We had a very difficult conversation about who that person was in my life. And they said to me through tears, just go to bed and we'll wake you up for church in the morning. I was that nerdy kid who loved going to church. It was my place to be and I always was there. But that morning, it was not my place to be. I knew that our pastor was conservative and the congregation as a whole leaned conservative, but I was not prepared for the words I would hear that morning. I don't remember which text the sermon was on or how slash why this was brought up, but from the pulpit that morning, I heard just how sinful LGBTQIA plus people are. It ripped me to pieces to have just come out to my parents the night before before I was ready to even do that and to hear these words in my safe place of worship, a place that raised me and called me beloved. Would I still be so beloved if they knew this secret? This started my crisis of faith. 
I felt as if I had to choose between, between being queer or being a Christian. When we got home, my parents sent my siblings away and asked, did you hear what the pastor said this morning? I sunk down my head and nodded. Well, what do you think about that? They asked. I don't recall where the conversation went from there, but I remember the tears and the pain we were all feeling. Fast forward a few months and I have just graduated high school and I was heading off to be a camp counselor at Lutheran Memorial Camp, where I've camped my whole life. I was so excited for the summer and I decided before arriving that no one would know my secret. As we were preparing our cabins for campers, my work buddy says to me, do you know what really disgusts me? Lesbians. I am sure my face was sending signals of shock and horror. Again, I don't remember how this conversation goes, but I assure myself I will certainly not be letting my secret out. Again, a place that felt safe and holy to me and I was hearing words that cut at the innermost being of who I am. I returned to work for a second summer after my first year of college, and I have found the courage to start coming out to a few close friends. I just spent a whole year on campus um, out, so I felt like I could do the same at camp. Ultimately, I was outed to the whole staff before I was ready, and this happened during the second week of camp. After that second week of camp, I never had campers again for the next six weeks remaining of that summer. When I asked why this odd coincidence had occurred, I was told how my presence was just needed in other places, but you can imagine the truth behind it. I made it through college relatively unscathed and finding more courage to be myself, especially after escaping the homophobia of Campus Crusade for Christ. That was a year long mistake, I can tell you. <laughs> After college, I immediately moved to Columbus, Ohio for seminary. It is in this place that I feel seen, loved, welcomed, and embraced. I finally felt free to be myself in ways I had never known before. While I was a student, I helped guide and lead the process for the seminary to become reconciling in Christ, which is the ELCA's version of being open and affirming. The board unanimously voted in support of this effort and naturally we celebrated with rainbow cupcakes. I felt so much joy in this space where my identity as a queer person and a beloved child of God were both celebrated and embraced. This was the healing, sp healing space I needed and had been longing for, but I knew this was a bubble of the church that would not last forever. While there were a few hiccups as I started my internship at Luther Memorial here in Seattle, Overall, the feeling of being celebrated and embraced continued. I finally had a church space that I could start healing again, a church that uplifted identities rather than condemning them. It was my seminary and Luther Memorial that I finally started my healing work where I allowed myself to be fully queer and fully Christian. But when I started interviewing for my first calls, I could tell that my church bubbles of safety were quickly disappearing. As I began interviewing for first calls, I was certain that my paperwork, which is like my resume, was clear in who I was, and I hoped that the church I would be interviewing at had done their work in order to call a queer pastor. In two instances, I was assured before accepting interviews that the church was ready and had done their work to call a queer pastor. The first church I interviewed for was in Colorado, and I was invited for an in-person interview. Sitting in the lead pastor's office, she shared with me just how a few months prior there had been a hate crime against a queer couple that attends as homophobic slurs were written on their name tags. The response was less than desirable from this reconciling in Christ church. How was I supposed to respond in that moment? As we were heading to dinner that night, of which I thought was just going to be the call committee, they mentioned to me, that they have intentionally invited people who are not comfortable with me being their pastor. So here I am at this dinner, not knowing who values my humanity and who doesn't, while we all share in a meal. Upon returning home to Seattle, I get the inevitable phone call that they just don't think they're ready for a queer pastor. Fast forward a few months and I start interviewing at a church in Wisconsin. Again, I'm assured that this church has done their work and they are ready to welcome a queer pastor. 
as the process continues, I ask what work they've done. And they said they worked with their interim pastor who went through all the clobber passages with them. This interim pastor was cisgender, straight, 70 year old plus. And I think for many of them, I was the first queer person they had met. Uh, again, another in-person interview happened and the call vote was so close that I felt they really weren't ready for a queer pastor yet. So I ended up turning down that call as well. As my year dragged on, I watched my whole seminary graduating class receive calls. And I was feeling rather defeated as I was the last one waiting to receive a call. I felt as if there was no place in the church for me. It was at that point that my beloved spouse, Kate, encouraged me to talk to Luther Memorial and present the idea to be ordained and become an additional pastor in their congregation. While that is technically against the rules of the ELCA to stay where you are, where you were an intern, this idea received much excitement from the leadership of Luther Memorial, and we felt confident that the bishop would work with us. A year to the day after I was assigned and started to interview, I was ordained to be the pastor of outreach and community at Luther Memorial. The tears and joy were abundant as I finally cleared that hurdle of being ordained. I'm so grateful for the people of Luther Memorial and their love for me. They do not require that my identity as a queer person remain outside of my identity as a pastor. They welcome and affirm both realities. And for that, I give thanks. The church has so much work to do. I hope and pray that I will not always have to struggle to receive a call, but the reality is that in the ELCA, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and queer candidates wait the longest to receive calls. So church, I ask that you have these hard conversations about who you are willing to let pastor you and be open to the possibility of LGBTQIA plus pastors as we bring so many gifts and the passion to be God's beloved community together. No one should ever have to choose between being a Christian pastor or being LGBTQIA plus. Thank you. I wanna thank Laura for uh, her sharing. Uh, Laura and I have become good friends and colleagues. Um, I was her landlord for almost two years. Uh, I, it seems like my basement apartment is for seminarians that are studying uh, for ministry. And so it, it's great uh, to hear from her and also from Jermel. Um, I always title my I, I talk like this is, what's a, a nice Catholic boy doing in a place like this? Um, and I've been asking that question uh, for 64 years. Um, I grew up Catholic and I grew up very Catholic. Uh, I was born on January 3rd and baptized on February 1st and immersed in Catholic culture uh, from daily mass, Catholic school, grade school, Blanchett High School, um, uh, just fully immersed in the, in the whole um, uh, process of of belief and liturgy and all of that. And I loved being Catholic, uh, so much so that after a period of discernment, um, I decided that I would study uh, for the Catholic priesthood in, in 1984. Um, this was after I had come out and I thought I had been able to reconcile being gay and uh, being Catholic, because in my mind, th there isn't a disconnect. In my mind, uh, uh, being Christian and being uh, spiritual and being gay um, are all a part of who I am and they play well together. Um, uh, unfortunately for a lot of people, they don't play well together and they are, they're, they're a real challenge. Um, uh, Jermel said something that was really powerful. Uh, the church um, valued all that I did for, and I did a lot when I was a Catholic priest uh, for 15 years. I started a new parish. When I left, uh, the parish had over a thousand families uh, attending. Uh, it was vibrant and active. Uh, I felt very valued for everything that I did, but pretty much unseen for who I am as a person. And so I had to live in that place of secrecy uh, in which I had shared with my uh, friends and family who I am, but certainly my congregation didn't know uh, and most people didn't know. 
And that disconnect from your public life to your private life um, is, it just becomes untenable, especially as you age. Um, you want greater level of authenticity. You want a, a greater level of simplicity. Uh, and uh, that just flies in the face of that uh, as you age. You, um, because I'm at peace and actually proud of who I am, the full person of who I am and being segmented by something that is dear to you as your faith uh, just becomes intolerable. Uh, being gay and Catholic is a difficult journey. Um, um, growing up, um, the Catholic Church in my early years taught that if you were gay, you were ontologically disordered. That means that you are disordered at the very essence of your being. Uh, they uh, have since changed that teaching, and now they teach that uh, we, we welcome and love gay people, but... Uh, since the only place for um, sexual expression is in heterosexual marriage, uh, we don't love and value uh, the people that you want to be in relationship or love. Um, this uh, teaching uh, is, uh, it's a natural law teaching. It, I always say it's always based on plumbing uh, below the, the waist rather than plumbing above the waist. Uh, and there has to be a complete redo of Catholic uh, sexual teaching. Um, I made the difficult decision um, after 15 years of being a Catholic priest to, to leave ordained ministry. And at that point, I was uh, extremely angry. I was angry for a church that uh, uh, loved what I did, but didn't love me for who I am. And so um, I didn't want anything to do with religion for several years. Uh, my church became the Seattle Men's Chorus. And so, um, and uh, that was a place where I um, um, had church until I was able to transfer my call to the United Church of Christ, where they called myself and my husband uh, to ministry uh, at Broadview. And I have felt uh, fully affirmed and valued in that. Um, you have to know though, that when you leave your, um, your church of your birth, there's a lot of grief that goes with that. Uh, and that grief isn't resolved because it's kind of like where you're born. It's part of, it's a part of who you are. So um, the things that I ask um, are, are difficult ones for the Catholic church and for Catholics uh, is to um, dissent from Catholic church teaching around sexual ethics, which many have done by just going out the door. Um, I'm grateful for all the numbers of people, a lot of Catholics who have supported marriage equality and that. Um, I just feel that uh, gay Catholics need to come out and make sure that they're known and identified in their churches as such. And we really do need a, a, a development, a, a, a rewrite, if you will, of ca Catholic sexual and ethical teaching. Uh, that's all, just a whole rewrite of uh, Catholic ethical teaching. Um, um, I, I'm very much at home in the United Church of Christ, but um, if I could go home, I, I would, but I am part of uh, the large Catholic uh, diaspora. Thank you for listening. Thank you so, so much, uh, dear friends, uh, Gary, Laura, Jermel, for your wisdom, your insights, your stories and leadership. So let's just take a few moments to reflect in silence on what you have said. And as the mystics say, allow this to perfume our heart. Just a few moments of silence. Thank you. So now our final group is led by Amira Khan and Imam El Farouk Haki from the Islamic community. Now their biographies. Amira Khan is a Bengali American Muslima whose Islam is informed by personal experience, theological training in the completion of her entire memorization of the Quran and progressive Muslim perspectives. She is informed by Sunni, Sufi, anti-patriarchal and liberation, theology-oriented traditions within uh, Sharia, 
Quran, Hadith, and Islamic history. She joined the Muslim Youth Leadership Council as a youth activist in 2018 to learn how empowered queer and transgender Muslims are reclaiming their narrative across the country. She's also an active member of El Tawheed Juma Circle Unity Mosque based in Toronto, Canada. And she co-founded the Madison branch of Unity Mosque. That was Amira Khan. And now our Imam, El Farooq Khaki, is a lawyer whose practice since 1993 focuses on refugee claims based on sexual orientation, gender, gender identity slash expression, and HIV. He is a co-owner of the Glad Day Bookshop, the world's oldest LGBTQ plus bookshop. He's an activist, popular public speaker, writer, author, and media commentator on Islam, LGBTQ+, human rights, refugees, politics, racism, HIV, and queer parenting. El Farooq is the founder of Salam, queer Muslim community in 1991, and co-founder an Imam of El Tawheed Juma Circle, the Unity Mosque, established in 2009. He is ordained as a reverend and officiates marriages for all orientations and genders. Let's welcome them. Welcome, friends. Salams, peace, and, and thank you for that uh, introduction. Can I add an all religious and non-religious uh, uh, people as well? So um, I believe in a ministry or in a theology of, of inclusion. Um, salams, everybody. My name is Al Farooq Khaki. I go by he, him pronouns. And um, not that there is a lack of LGBTIQ Muslims in the world, but uh, in terms of organization and visibility, that you guys had to import me from Canada, and you've had to import Amira uh, from across the um, across the states. And I'll speak to that um, as I uh, as I go forward. I want to acknowledge that I am in Toronto, in in Canada. It is the traditional territories. Um, of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples. It is also the land of the Petun and the Huron-Wendat peoples. And most recently, it has been in the stewardship of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations. It is also the land of the One Dish, One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant uh, between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe and other nations to share the resources and the caretaking of this land. Today, Toronto, Takaranto, is the home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. Uh, and I am thankful um, to have the honor and the privilege to live, work, pray, um, and be active in this territory um, and to be able to join you today. Mm. I feel that in contextualizing my journey as a gay Muslim man, uh, and as a feminist that um, I need to also contextualize Islam. Islam, I think for many folks, particularly in North America, is sometimes seen as being foreign and frightening and uh, something unknown and something disconnected from the general societal and cultural context in which most people seem to function uh, in, uh, on Turtle Island, Turtle Island being North America in the indigenous uh, traditions of, um, of the land that, that I'm on. Um, Islam is not a monolith, just like Christianity, Judaism, or any other tradition are not monoliths. It is not an ahistorical or an acultural tradition. In fact, it is the, the tradition of over 1.5 billion people all around the world. 
wouldn't have spread that way if it was not responsive to people's needs and to people's lives. Um, I'm often reminded that um, the 15th centuries of some other traditions weren't always the greatest time and place to be. And uh, Islam is in its 15th century now. And um, I'm not sure how long it takes to get better because I think we're all working towards something better. Um, and I always say that Islam is a journey, not a destination, but I think our all of our lives and all of our journeys within our lives are, are journeys and not destinations, right? Um, I am inspired by uh, chapter 49, verse 13 of the Quran in my work that speaks to um, the fact that the creator created diversity. I created you into different nations and tribes that you may know and learn from each other, not that you may despise each other. And so the, the concept of dialogue and talking um, uh, is in my understanding of Islam. And this is all that I can present to you is my Islam, uh, again, because I cannot claim to speak for every other person's Islam. Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi, uh, one of my teachers, um, said, there are a thousand ways to kneel and to kiss the ground. Um, and I think that's true in many diverse traditions. It is certainly true in Islam. I think the visible face of Islam today would uh, seem to undermine that notion of, of diversity and, and inclusion. Um, but I don't think that is the actual lived reality for a lot of Muslims around the world. And it's certainly not the historical reality. A lot of the groundwork done by our Jewish and Christian siblings as Abrahamic traditions around the inclusions around gender and sexual orientation and gender identity certainly paves the way for um, modern conversations. Though in many Muslim societies and cultures, there have been accommodations um, and spaces made, particularly for um, th so-called third gender uh, or gender non-conforming peoples throughout history. That includes the Khwaja Sarai and the Hijra uh, people in South Asia, uh, the Waria in Southeast Asia, and, and, and so on. A lot of those realities have been erased. A lot of those histories have been buried they're not convenient. They're not convenient at all. Mm. They're not convenient to societal control and they're not convenient to patriarchy that would uh, subjugate anybody and create a hierarchy. I'm, I'm guided by my, my friend and my mentor and my teacher, Dr. Amina Wadub, when she speaks of Tawheed and how patriarchy is a form of shirk. It's a form of idolatry because it creates hierarchies and power imbalances that places other humans between an individual and their creator. Um, I like this. It's, it's part of my journey into my theology and into my own uh, balance, my own mizan. Um, and ending that, uh, I'm not sure who it was. Was it Gary talking about the the having to live this 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 schizophrenia? All of the previous speakers spoke of it, but it is a schizophrenia, right? Um, and and that forces us to live this lie when, um, as people of faith, we are looking for authenticity and connection to our Creator, and through that, to the for me anyway, to the to, to the universe. And I remember a few years ago. Uh, going with my with my husband and my parents and my aunt and my cousin to uh, do the Umrah, which is the lesser Hajj. It's the, the out of season Hajj. And here we are in, in the holiest space and place in, in Islam. And my husband and I had to hide who we were to each other. And we had to lie to people and we had to avoid people when we are there for authenticity and for truth, right? And that sort of schism, um, and when I travel back to visit my family in, in certain parts of East Africa, it's, we have to go through that same thing. Uh, we can't even go to the same, uh, you know, to the same immigration officer, let alone how we move in, in society. And yet these laws were brought in by colonialism. They were brought in by the British as part of their, uh, as part of their Victorian morality that was imposed. Um, and so I think when you also talk about Islam today and when you talk about what queer Muslims are facing today, um, it is part and parcel of the larger picture around colonialism, racialization, poverty, uh, enslavement, 
um, and, and othering. And all of that ties up into what feeds fundamentalism and what feeds xenophobia and what feeds fear, just fear itself. And this, I think, is the context that we as, as Muslims are living in, not just in on Turtle Island, but in many parts of the world. Of course, whether we live as minorities or majorities also influences that. Um, the internet has, I think, redefined the world in so many ways, and COVID has redefined distance. So the, with the internet, we could connect with people across the world and find community. And now with COVID, uh, we're confined to platforms. So I am as close and as far away from each of you as each of you are to each other, whether you are a five minute walk from each other or around the world. And I think what the internet has done, especially within the Muslim context, it's allowed people to connect. And it's allowed, because we don't have the um, formalization of distinct churches in the same way or of uh, the different uh, interpretive choices within Judaism with the different movements uh, within within Judaism. We don't have that. Um, and there has been a well, there's been a, a tsunami of, of Wahhabi influenced Islam that has erased a lot of the nuances, cultures and so on and so forth. My own journey, I grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm a West Coaster. Um, I wasn't born on the West Coast. I was born in, in East Africa. My family came to Canada uh, from Africa to England and then eventually to, to Canada. When I first started realizing I was gay, uh, I, I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought I was a sinner. I thought I would go to hell and I'd pray every night to go to, uh, when I went to bed, I'd pray every night to wake up straight. Um, I'm 57, it clearly didn't happen. Uh, at some point, um, I had to reconcile myself. In, in, in Islam, um, Allah is known, the creator is, not, is known through the 99 most beautiful names. And 113 out of the 114 verses of the Quran begin within the name of Allah, the tenderly compassionate, the infinitely merciful. Um, I think God, the creator, is telling us uh, by this fact um, that this is the lens that uh, we should use in coming to the text. So if you're coming with uh, the crusher, the angry, the this, the constrictor, and so on and so forth, that's not, that's not the Allah that, that is being presented to you. So I believe that we're all created in God's image, but I think the problem is that we create God in our image. Uh, and it is unlearning that that uh, is, is part of the, the challenge. So I took solace and I took um, shelter and sanctuary in the Allah that is Rahman and Rahim. Both of these words, both of these attributes uh, find have the same root as the word for womb in Arabic. And so this womb like this creator that exhibits these womb like qualities um, would not create me this way in order to simply condemn me. And so that was part of the, the process of my theology of finding peace within myself. I also believe that, that uh, misogyny, sexism, uh, and homophobia, transphobia are, are flip sides of the same coin, uh, coins minted by patriarchy, and that we cannot deal with queer inclusion until we deal with, with gender inclusion. We cannot deal with justice uh, for LGBTIQ2S people if we do not deal with, with, uh, uh, with gender justice. Um, I created uh, the Unity Mosque in 2009 with my husband and our friend, Dr. Lori Silvers, uh, an American Muslim woman who uh, moved up to Canada. And Lori and I had met uh, on, online, bef online um, through uh, progressive or inclusive Muslim circles before we actually physically met. At one point after a series of events, um, we came to starting this space, a place where all kinds of people were welcome, Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Allah in the Quran refers to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a mercy to the world. Um, can't be a mercy to the world if people can't hear your message. And so our, and, and our, so our space is open to everybody. And I would like to think of it as a spiritual well that is accessible to anyone and everyone, whether you want a sip or a cup or a jug uh, or you want to jump in that's that's your choice um and if you don't want any that's also your 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 choice um 
so I, I, I sort of grinned, Laura, when you spoke about the hurdle of being ordained, because nobody is going to ordain me uh, in a, in a, in a Muslim, in a dominant culture, Muslim community. So we've had to create our own spaces. And um, a lot of queer Muslim spaces are actually inclusive of non queers. Um, and I hope that in this that we are building uh, friends and allies and collaborators, um, because it is in subverting the status quo that we will all find liberation. Uh, how am I doing for time? You're doing well, you got about four minutes to go. Or three minutes to go. All right. Um, so, so for me, um, the work of the of the mosque has been. Uh, we welcome, like I said, Muslims as well as non-Muslims, and Muslims is a self-identified um, uh, uh, identity for our folks, and they come from across the uh, the religious gamut uh, within within Islam, um, and we work on the basis of a shared authority in the context that everybody has an access to the pulpit, to the minbar, to be able to give a sermon, um, to lead prayer. And it is in that, that rotate, we also sit in a circle. So in Islam, the halakha this is, a, is a place of learning, the Islamic learning circle. And so when we meet in real life, and we haven't done that in, in, in over a year now, uh, but when we meet in real life, we live in a circle because there are no hierarchies in the circle and it's constantly rotating. And by having different people give the sermon every Friday, what we also do is keep alive the notion that your experience is also part of, the, is also part of your truth. Um, and that, and that, that truth that needs to be, to be affirmed, right? Because we are the sum total of our experiences. And so, um, the lived experience, the embodiment of, um, of you, an individual spirituality and their experience, their religious experience, then becomes a teaching moment for everybody else and uh, a possible point of learning as well as unlearning. Um, I look forward to the day when um, all mosques are inclusive uh, and, and gender equal and welcoming of all genders and orientations. I was chatting with uh, Dr. Amina Wadud uh, yesterday on on her on her show, and uh, she does a, a a Zoom session regularly. And she said uh, she's a few years older than me, and she said she didn't think this was going to happen in her lifetime. Uh, I'm not sure when it's going to happen. I don't want to predict which lifetime, um, but the the road is is long. Um, and for those of our siblings who might be a little bit further along on the yellow brick road, your road is still long too. And so um, I look forward to the journey with all of you. Thank you for your time and for your ears. Salams. Thank you, Al Farooq. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, everyone. May the peace and blessings of Allah, the glorious, the divine presence and consciousness be upon each and every one of you. My name is Amira Khan, and I am on the land of the Wahdakute, the traditional lands of the Wahdakute and the Lakota in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, so you did go across the states to get me. <laughs> Um, I am a trans woman. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And my being able to come to this was not an easy journey. I began by, um, by being raised in my hometown of St. Louis, Missouri. <clears throat> um, in St. Louis, Missouri, I grew up in West County, which is a relatively affluent suburb of the St. Louis city. Um, however, my family was not very well off. We were often for all of my childhood, we were on government food stamps and the like. Um, and I went to the masjid, the masjid that was so, it was very South Asian centered and very Arab centered. My mother during my youth had a spiritual awakening and she decided from that, that she wanted to become closer and closer to spiritual community. So she moved from the outskirts of the county to closer and closer to the masjid until we lived right next door to it. And this masjid, um, the house of worship for Muslims is the biggest one in St. Louis. 
it is the only funeral home that does Muslim specific rites in the entire state of Missouri. And we had um, many speakers come through, many imams, and I was given, I was really given a community in, in Desi culture, everyone who is older than us, we call an uncle or an auntie because everyone is family in the masjid. So I had so many uncles and so many aunties who I could go to for support and with my questions and with my um, desire to have fun. I remember all of these fond memories of having, uh, of going out to camp in the wilderness with these other uncles and aunties who actually knew how to camp unlike my own parents um, and playing dodgeball and all of these things. It was, a, it was a, I felt like I was not left out in that community. I, all, I balanced this side with the Sunday school and the Saturday school and a little bit of memorizing Quran with public school. And in public school, I never felt like I was one of these. Like I always had a feeling that I was better than each other, my all of my other classmates, right? Which I've grown out of um, realizing that is a bit of arrogance. But um, I, I always thought I have the guidance of Islam. I have the truth in my heart. Why would I associate with all of you? <laughs> Um, and uh, I, felt I felt held by my community for a very long time, even when I was taken out of public school for the sixth and seventh grade and dedicated my entire life after that to um, memorizing the Quran for those two and a half years, full time, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. as a 13 year old, just memorizing lines and lines and pages of pure Arabic. Um, and learning the translation to that actually on the side. All of this um, was because I felt like I was doing the right thing. I was part of the community that was on the truth. I was dedicating my life and devoting it to Allah and her glory. And then came high school. I entered high school with carrying the Quran in my heart after I finished memorization in 2009. And I fell in love. For the first time, I fell in love with a human being who was male at the time. And I was also male at the time. And I said, what's happening here? This doesn't make sense to me. And, and I would just, but the, my attraction, my love for him was just overwhelming. It was like nothing I'd ever felt before. I just wanted to spend so much time with this person, picking apart their brain, asking them questions about how they thought. Um, and they were atheists. And I was like, what's happening, right? And, and we spent so much time and my excuse, right? Because I had strict parents who said, you're not hanging out with any of these friends. And I said, but it's for the science fair. So she said, all right. So <laughs> that's, how, that's how I got to spend lots of time with my crush. And eventually he said, you're not spending time with me because we're working on the science fair project. You're working, you're here because you love me. You're gay. And I said, no, I'm not gay. He said, yes, you are. And then I went home and I thought about it and I went to bed that night realizing, oh shoot, I am gay. This is not good. Because, so the, the next morning I woke up with a sense of, of relief that I knew who I was, but then a sense of total despair because I knew I couldn't be who I was in my community. So I went through a lot of suicidal ideation throughout my entire high school because I had no one to go to. I knew that any of these uncles and aunties that I could have come out to, that I could have shared my truth with would not hold that for me. So I had to hold this as a burden affecting my own mental health while I'm doing all of the stress of college applications and everything. I got lucky that Allah had provided me one friend who I happened to go to the local community college with him. We both um, we both carpooled together to these classes while I was still in high school. And during these, uh, these uh, commutes, we got to know each other a lot better. And he was someone who was not judgmental at all. And so to him, he was the first person I could ever come out to. And I, I credit my stabilization and my being alive today to him. Then I graduate high school and I enter college with finally having realized, yes, I am gay. And my, um, and my test in life is to repress that, 
to repress the sexual urges that come from that. That's what I entered my college thinking. I made friends with the MSA, the Muslim Student Association there. They were my closest friends for most of my time in college, but I never told anyone my secret. Then one day I fell in love with another person. Uh, and we, um, had an, we had a very strong experience together and we, we debated. I asked about atheism and I asked about, I said that I love you, so I want to convert you to Islam. And he said, that will not happen. I'm an atheist. And I said, why not? And we debated and went back and forth and back and forth. And I realized that his atheism was just as valid of a worldview as mine. It may not have been as rich as spiritually fulfilling, but it was just as valid and I could not invalidate it. So then after that, I, I realized that slowly but surely, I, slow, I realized that perhaps the way I have been viewing the world has not been the same. It, it's not, it's restricting me now. It's restricting reality. And if my worldview, if my religion does not accommodate reality, then I'm not really living in God's world. So then after that, I came out, I came out as gay originally, um, initially. And as uh, Laura mentioned, earlier, many queer people, we come out uh, several times. It is a progression of coming out. So the first time I came out was gay, was as gay. I came out by reading a spoken word poem in front of a audience of hundreds of Muslims in Knoxville, Tennessee. And um, while the administration of who was organizing the spoken word poetry um, formally apologized for allowing me to perform that poem, and there were some people there that came up to me afterwards and said, thank you so much for this. And they connected me with other queer Muslims. And that was the first time that I knew that there was another LGBTQ Muslim alive in the world besides me. I had never known that, that we existed. And in these groups, uh, these online groups where I learned and I discussed and resources were shared and interpretations were shared, that's when I heard about um, the seminal work of Scott Kugel, Homosexuality in Islam. And I read this book and I looked at the verses of Sodom and Gomorrah that are mentioned in the Quran. And I realized that the homophobic interpretations were mostly imports from colonialism and that they were not accurate. They were selectively removing context to justify homophobia and transphobia. And that's when I, I, that's when I learned in my heart, in my gut that I am holy. I am a trans person. I've been through so much fitna and trials and Allah does not lay a burden on any soul more than it can bear. That's mentioned in the Quran. And I'll recite this line for you. Allah does not lay on any soul a burden more than it can bear. And my entire life I had felt that being queer was a burden more than I could ever bear. And I learned that, that my test was not to be queer and to repress it, but I learned that my test was to be queer openly with my chest and face the, the, the communal uh, flack from that and to be faced with all the trials that come with existing proudly and fully. This was hard for me. After I came out of the call out, after I came out of the, of the closet, I lost almost all of my MSA friends. I faced a social death. Like Gary was saying, there was a moment of grieving. I needed to grieve that all of my, my close friends who I had thought that I was going to rely on would leave me. And they did leave me. But with that, I found so many, so many, so many new people who embraced me the way I was, who embraced me 
despite all of their different theologies and their different religions and their lack thereof, people from so many different walks of life held me in my truth and they taught me they taught me how to walk with God. And I didn't know that before, before that, that there would be other ways to walk with God other than that which what I was taught. But then I learned. Then I learned with all of these people who held me um, when no one else would. And so today, part of my personal mission is to make sure that LGBTQ Muslims across the country and even across the world, if that is, if that God wills for that to be in my scope, to give them a sense of community, to give them a sense of groundingness in their own identity, um, to not be ostracized from their own community. So, and so to find, give them community, right? Because some, oftentimes us queer people, we cannot wait for the rest of the world to catch up with accepting us. We have to create our own spaces. We must take the initiative because that's too long of a wait. Hmm. The, the Arabic word for trial is fitna, and it comes from the same root as flame, specifically that of a furnace. And this is because when the smith places the gold ore in the furnace, and he brings out from that furnace a pure gold, that is fitna. The fire tests the gold, and the gold is either purified or incinerated. And the trials that God gives us are the, the fires of hardship of being cast out from our family or our community. And if we put our trust in Allah, then we come out stronger in the end. We polish the mirrors of God that are our own hearts and bodies, and we come out as reflections of Allah on earth. And this is why when I say marginalized people, trans people who have gone through so much of this effort to find themselves and to walk in a path that rejects them. That's why I say trans people are divine. Trans people are holy. Trans people are our teachers. And this is why I firmly believe that folks who pass away of suicide within the trans community have found a home in the beyond because Allah knows how close I was to that. I leave with a hadith, a saying of the prophet, when there is a matter which you do not know, if it is halal or haram, the prophet says, istafti qalbak, ask your heart. And I have asked my heart many, many times, many times if my existence was valid, if my existence was holy, if I could walk in Allah's path. And my heart says I can. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Amira and Imam El Farouk for your rich stories and leadership. Let's all take a moment and reflect on what we've just heard. I'll give the book to Mom. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we seen something. Thank you. Here? Thank you. We have heard these stories and felt their impact. There is so much to take in. To give us all a moment to breathe in these stories, we turn now to Imam Jamal Rahman for a spiritual practice. Jamal is a part of the core team that planned this event. Thank you, Brother John. Wow, I feel my heart so opened up by these beautiful, genuine insights and wisdom. And I think all those practices I was thinking of, I'll just <laughs> let go of those. And the best practice is just silence. But I just wanna say a few words about silence. Silence is universal. There's no such thing as a Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist silence. It's just silence. I love the metaphor of Rumi, which I repeat all the time, who says, you know, we human beings are like fish out of water thrashing and quivering on the banks. And if we must from time to time dive into those life-giving oceans of silence. So we, we become refreshed, uh, nurtured, nourished. I also want to repeat the words of Rumi who says, silence 
is not the absence of sound. It is the absence of the little self. I, 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 me, me, me. Rumi also says silence is the language of God. Everything else is a poor translation. So let's do a, a simple silent practice and let's not work too hard on it. I, I want to quote the Buddha who says, you know, in doing this work of silence in your concentration, uh, imagine a bird in the palm of your hand. If the fist is too tight, the bird dies. If it's too loose, the bird flies away. So just silence. And if in, in silence, if thoughts come, images come, do some compassionate self-talk, letting go, letting go, release, release. Or if you're cyber savvy, uh, delete, delete, cancel, cancel. Okay, close your eyes, please. And simply focus on your nostril and simply become aware of your breath as you inhale and as you exhale, just this much. Any thoughts, any images, of course, they'll come compassionately. Remember, letting go, letting go, and back to your nostril. Just be with your breath, please. Now gently, please come into awareness as I do a chant. The words that Imam Farooq mentioned in Arabic, I'll say it. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. La ilaha. Illallah, la ilaha illallah. At your convenience, please open your eyes.